Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. We're really excited to have you, and we hope that by the time you leave, you'll be excited as well. So, um, can we move forward to the next screen? Thank you. Um, this is a little bit of what you're going to be seeing this evening. We're going to talk about four particular, or four different aspects of um, deconstructing racism. But while you take a look at this agenda, let me um, introduce the Coalition on Races, Race, um, Anti-Racism Committee, who all um, put together what you're going to be seeing tonight. Um, so let me, um, I don't know if we can um, spotlight the people when I name them, okay. Um, Judy Bernstein, guess wave. Um, Judy, there she is. Um, Judith Gaston. Hey, there she is. Kristen Lissanti. Coming to us, just getting over COVID. See how dedicated she is. <laughs> um, Mickey Murphy. And myself, Barbara Velasquez, I am the chair of the um, Coalition on Races, Anti-Racism Committee. So, um, as you see, basically we have a look, we'll get an opportunity to have some questions and answers at the end of the, um, of the program, after we're finished talking, and then some more information that you will have available to you. So, can we move to the next screen, please? Okay, so this is this deconstructing racism. And what is deconstructing racism? What is this, is this going to be? This, I will tell you, is the introduction to deconstructing racism, which will be a four-part community course that will be held next February, starting in, um, um, F, um, what is February? Um, well, at least in February to uh, May of, of 2023. And this was developed by the Anti-Racism Committee and informed by painstaking study and research that we all, within our um, abilities, um, studied, read, researched in order to put this program together. Um, and it's based on evidence and science. It is designed to benefit the entire community, all races can benefit from this. So it's not just, um, so this is information that we have put together that is not normally available to most people. Um, we, as you will see, have been almost brainwashed by the overarching um, uh, activities with regard to race. So this is, um, will benefit the entire community of all races. And tonight's preservation, um, pres presentation is, as I said, an overview of the, of the full program. So you're not going to see all of the um, articles and the videos and other um, interactive things that we will be um, including in our program next week. This is just basically a skeleton um, overview of what you will be seeing. And we hope you're going to be really excited and you will register right away for next year's program. So please invite your family and friends to join you in the full program on deconstructive racism. And there'll be an opportunity for you to take away um, either to register or to have the registration link. Um, next screen. Okay. Deconstructing racism explores how our society is infused by racist conditions and systems that impact us all, both behaviorally and psychologically, and what we can do to disrupt them. But first, we're going to have to take a look at how it got developed. What happened, what I wrote um, in Facebook was, science says there's no such thing as race. So where has race come from? So we're going to look at our culture of white supremacy and how that got started. The next um, part is going to be how it is upheld and maintained. So once you start something in order for it to continue going, you have to uphold it and make sure that it continues 
to have an impact within a society. It's um, impact on people of color and surprisingly on white people and the nation as a whole. And then lastly, what we can do to disrupt it. Because once we learn and understand what has happened, it's our obligation to make conscious changes and do things to disrupt what has been happening for 400 years. Next screen, please. Okay, so now we're going to get started with our program. We have only a short period of time, so we're gonna go right into it. Um, the first part of Deconstructing Racism is going to be an overview of white supremacy and our white supremacist culture. And the person that will be handling this part is um, Judy Bernstein. Judy, take it away. Actually, uh, Oh, Mickey, I'm sorry, I got mixed up. Mickey Murphy <laughs> no is going to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> no worries at all. It's been a, a fun team to uh, collaborate with. So um, thank you, Barbara, and good evening, everyone. Um, as Barbara said, there are four sections to this course that we'll be offering, beginning with uh, part one, the exploration of white supremacy. Um, in order to deconstruct racism, it's important to establish some truths about race and the history of white supremacy in America. And we've chosen to focus initially on white supremacy and not racism because it is the ideology of white supremacy that gave rise to the concept of race and the practice of racism in the earliest days of our nation. And also because it is an ideology that although we don't like to confront it, uh, it still operates insidiously today. So while some would prefer to think that white supremacy is a fringe ideology espoused by some you know, bad actors and fringe characters, we will establish in this first section that it is an ideology that is absolutely central to the framing and development of our country. It's not fringe, it's core. So you can see here, Leila Saad, author of Me and White Supremacy, defines it as a racist ideology that is based upon the belief that white people are superior to people of other races and that therefore white people should be dominant over other races. These words are hard to hear, but this is also the definition that you might find if you looked up white supremacy in Webster's or Britannica. Uh, the, the notion of superiority and the dominance um, associated with it are two twin pillars that are widely understood as, uh, as being the foundations of white supremacy. So you may also know of uh, the author Ta-Nehisi Coates, author of Between the World and Me, The Water Dancer, and some other books. Um, this quote of his, race is the child of racism, highlights the fact um, that first there was this notion of white supremacy, and after that came the racial categorizations that we know and we use today. Next slide, please. Um, so in order to have a productive conversation about dismantling racism, there are three and probably many more fundamental truths to reckon with. Uh, the first is that white supremacy was carefully and deliberately constructed and has been intentionally perpetuated in a very overt way for most of the 400 plus years of our history. Uh, the second, as Barbara already mentioned, is that race is not a biological reality. It's a social construct that has devastating consequences, but is not based in science. Uh, though, as we'll see, there've been many attempts throughout the history uh, of our country to suggest that there is a hierarchy of humankind. Um, and the third is that white supremacy has evolved into a systemic reality that continues to determine life experiences and outcomes, it continues to have adverse effects on people who are not white. Next slide, please. Um, the beginnings of racial hierarchy uh, dates back, of course, to the very beginnings of our uh, country and before to the dehumanization and eventual genocide of indigenous people. Um, we all know that the first Africans uh, were, brought, were brought to our shores in 1619, and initially they could have been described as indentured servants in that their servitude was 
not yet tied to the identity of being black. Um, they were small in number initially, and they just shared the bottom rung of society with white indentured servants, mostly poor um, people from England, Ireland, Germany, um, were the, in, the European indentured servants. But it wasn't long before the colonies began enacting laws that specifically excluded black workers from any protections of the government. So in this section, we're going to look at the legal framework of white superiority and dominance that began with the laws of the colonies. A particular turning point in 1986 was Bacon's Rebellion, which hastened the transition to racial bondage for life. Bacon, you may have learned this in, in uh, elementary school or high school or college, uh, led a co coalition of whites and black servants um, against uh, the, the Virginia government. And that exposed some class tensions within the white society and demonstrated that those two groups at the bottom rung could unite in a cause uh, and, and that created great fear for the ruling class. Um, and at that point, they realized that there would always be a uh, difficulty in the social order as long as uh, white labor was um, was depended upon. So it was then that they decided to increase the number of enslaved Africans and began enacting laws that placed greater restrictions on African people. And we mentioned that because it was really a turning point and the, really the beginning of, um, of uh, this um, legal separation of people by race or by what would become race. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about that history, and then we'll move on to talk about how it also could be found in the thinking of founders of the country, uh, like Thomas Jefferson. Um, here he says, I advance it, therefore, that the Blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, are inferior to the whites in the endowment of both body and mind. We all know that Thomas Jefferson was a principal author of the Declaration of Independence and owned 600 enslaved people over his lifetime. So we'll be thinking about the irony of promoting liberty, freedom, democracy, while participating in and supporting um, a system of bondage and brutal dehumanization. All of this is part of our legacy that we have to examine that we can't excise from history books or you know, not teach our, our children. Um, so we're going to explore the ways in which our national narrative that we really cling to with fervor really has not matched our actions time and again. Next slide, please. So moving beyond colonial times, we're going to spend some time looking at the many laws that specifically upheld white supremacy by denying rights to those who are not white as our nation formed and developed for the next few hundred years. Um, beginning here with the 1790 Naturalization Act that restricted citizenship, you know, in writing to free white persons of good character, and thereby excluding Native Americans, also excluding the indentured servants who were European, excluding Africans, um, and later Asians. Um, so as this list of laws shows, many of them should be familiar. Uh, there has been an explicit relationship between race and law from the earliest foundations of American society. And what has been consistent is that with each law, white people have always been at the top. There have been laws restricting the rights and the uh, rights of and also rendering as second class citizens every group of people of color. But never have there been any laws restricting the rights of white people based on race. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, we'll also spend some time talking about the science of race, uh, the fact that there really is no biological basis for the racial categories that we use. Um, we'll talk about the fact that humans share 99% of DNA, um, that race is not a biological reality, but it is a social construct. And we'll look into some of the scientists who attempted to legitimize racism by dividing humankind into separate and unequal races. One of the more um, well-known race scientists was Samuel Morton, who believed that what was called cranial capacity or the size of the skull 
determined intellectual ability. I think he used to collect these skulls from around different regions and then put, you know, something like marbles or beans in them to see which had the largest capacity. And he claimed that that was evidence of racial hierarchy that put Caucasians on the top rung and Africans on the bottom. Um, so Morton and many other scientists or pseudoscientists gave legitimacy to the notion of racial hierarchy and justify the unequal treatment of people who are not white. So we'll take a look at um, some of that history. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to the fact that the science was flawed, we all know that membership criteria has changed over the years. Who could be white? Who was considered white? Um, and so since race is a social construct, it has been subject to changing social dynamics. Uh, this quote here from Paul Kivel uh, sums it up. Whiteness is a constantly shifting boundary, separating those who are entitled to certain privileges from those whose exploitation and vulnerability to violence is justified by their not being white. And that's a sort of jam-packed quote that we'll, we'll, we'll pick apart. There's a lot to, um, to think about and discuss there. Um, but we know that the concept of race has evolved based on expedience and uh, the desire to join the white race or to be white has always been driven by the privileges that were inherent in being associated, uh, the power and privilege that was there by design. So it's important to note that race has never been a neutral category that just maybe happened to be misused in a racist way. The concept of race was created for racist purposes. Next slide, please. Um, throughout the sections of this course, we're going to be talking about the many forms in which white supremacy is enacted through racism. And this chart is one way to conceptualize the forms that racism can take. It suggests that there are two major forms, individual and systemic. Individual being about attitudes, beliefs, prejudice, bias, bigotry, that kind of thing and systemic having to do with systems that are perpetuated, whether or not the individuals hold feelings of prejudice or bias. And we'll talk about in this section and in greater depth in the other sections, how persistent wealth and income gaps, health disparities, housing, education are all examples of structural racism um, that we can see to this day. Next slide, please. Um, so we're going to trace the evolution of white supremacist oppression from enslavement at the top there until the present day. We'll spend time on the backlash that met reconstruction, uh, such as the burning of Tulsa that we're all familiar with um, and other thriving black communities. Um, we'll talk about the rise of Jim Crow after reconstruction and the racial terror lynchings. Um, then redlining and other policies um, that were uh, implemented to deny access to higher living standards and to wealth creation. Um, and the intentionally uh, racially targeted war on drugs uh, that really um, precipitated mass incarceration. And then we'll talk about efforts uh, that persist today, such as uh, disenfranchisement. Um, and I would add um, the rise of hate groups and the resurgence of racial violence we'll also take a look at. Next slide, please. So in order to move toward de deconstructing racism, we have to confront our part in upholding the status quo. Um, when we do uphold the status quo or when we don't acknowledge or even know about the bias that we carry, uh, when we deny our privilege, uh, when we internalize the narrative, when we locate the problem in communities that have been victimized rather than the systems that continue to do that, um, when we do this knowingly or unknowingly, we are supporting the, the uh, existence and continuation of white supremacy. So next slide, please. 
we can't talk about white supremacy without engaging with the concept of white privilege, the reality of white privilege. And so we go, we're going to end this first section on white supremacy by helping people connect to examples of privilege in their daily lives. Uh, a person can say honestly that they're not racist. They don't harbor feelings of superiority or negativity toward people of color. They're not colorblind or that they are, excuse me, they are colorblind. Uh, but in a full understanding of white supremacy that I hope we'll gain from these a couple of weeks together, will reveal that it cannot be said that we're not impacted by the nearly 400 year, really overt, deliberate, legal positioning of white Americans above all Americans of color. And one of the resources we're going to use to do that is uh, this um, Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. So, um, White supremacy is a powerful social, political, and economic construct that continues to have real consequences. Um, and in the next section, Judy Bernstein will talk about how white supremacy is upheld. Thank you, Mickey. Um, hi, everyone. We're so happy that you're joining us this evening to learn about our upcoming offering. So as Mickey said, after in the program, after exploring the conditions that have created white supremacy and this racism in our country, in the second month of our program, we're going to investigate how white supremacy is upheld, what keeps these unjust conditions going. After all, the civil rights movement catalyzed huge changes in our society. And yet somehow these gross inequities persist. Um, in a previous slide, Mickey shared the evolution of white supremacist oppression. Um, you can see how racism keeps shape shifting. So what are the forces that keep it going? Um, one is the, the laws and policies, institutions, the basic systemic realities that Mickey just described and the consequent social organizations that are still present and operating in our society. That's a major factor. And that factor um, conditions all of us uh, towards implicit bias. Um, these individual internalized responses that we can't help but developing just because the surrounding milieu is, is um, flooded with it. Um, uh, so uh, in Robert Livingston's book, The Conversation, he um, offers us the image of a stream to help us conceptualize how our system works. In his analogy, individuals, we are the fish, and society is the stream we inhabit and navigate. So there are forces and currents in the stream, for instance, technological advances that push everything in one direction. Racism is also one of these currents. At times it's strong and visible, like when we see images of police brutality against people of color. At other times it can be very an undercurrent, undercurrent and um, obscured like um, subtle discrimination practices in employment. But whether or not we're aware, the current is always there moving everything downstream. And just like the current, racism can affect individuals without their knowledge and even against their will. So either way, it's affecting our outcomes. If we do nothing but float in the stream, the current will eventually carry us out to sea. And from this systemic perspective, racism has nothing to do with our intentions, with our brains, with our hearts. It's really about how our actions or inactions allow the dynamics already in place to move us in a certain direction. So ignorance and complicity strengthen and perpetuate these racist systems. So let's view, review a few of the external, societal, and the internal conditions upholding racism. 
So on this, let's talk about the first one here. There are many examples. Here's two examples. The first is the economic inequality. And I would suggest that the e economic and power base were two of the major reasons for the development of white supremacy. So um, there's an oppre a stark oppression for prevent of black and people of color preventing them from acquiring wealth and creating conditions, Mickey's referred to them already, laws, policies, violence that severely limit Black people from acquiring wealth. And because there's also the conditions prevent people from moving upwards in the system and getting trained and um, because they don't have time to get trained. They're just in these menial jobs that provide them with just enough to um, have clothing, food, and shelter. So they can't um, move up. There's no mobility, economic mobility. Um, uh, please go to the next slide, slide 18. Thanks. I just wanted to show you, this is a really um, striking table provided by the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice that compares household racial wealth, household racial wealth gap in our country and in our state. On the left-hand side of the diagram, the, the tall teal color, um, if you can read that, it's more than $171,000 um, um, as the median income for white families in the United States. The next olive green slice is uh, indicates the black median income in the United States, which is $9,600. And the yellow one is $25,000. And that is the median income for Latino, Latina families. The, the, the tallest um, bar that's teal, this is, these are the New Jersey statistics, and $322,500 is the median income for white families in New Jersey. Next to that is $17,700 for Black families and $26,000 for Latino or Latino families. Um, so this is um, not income. This is wealth. This is um, median household wealth. So you can just see these dramatic um, discrepancies. Um, next slide, please. So the second um, example of systemic um, ways that we uphold racism and the system in this country is unequal treatment within the educational system, making it extremely difficult for children um, to succeed, BIPOC children to succeed. So typically the um, educational resources for kids of color, the facilities, school materials, skillfulness of the educators can be um, less than in um, predominantly white schools that um, there's, um, and there's, there have been many studies of this, there's unconscious internalized racial bias amongst many of the educators with, who and tend to interpret and respond to the same behaviors um, from white and black kids differentially with much more negative consequences for black and um, other children of color. And there are lower expectations typically for black student performance. Um, next slide, please. Uh, other institutional systems that both historically and currently perpetuate racial inequalities and oppression and oppression include um, limitations on voting rights, suppressing BIPOC voices, health care disparities, which goes from the training of medical professionals, which is racially biased, to the medical treatment and facilities provided for people of color. Um, resulting in very significant poor health outcomes. And the third um, uh, symbol there is um, discrepancies and unfair treatment within the criminal justice system with hugely disproportionate numbers of 
people of color incarcerated, which of course is going to impact them and their families for the rest of their lives. Um, and it says, I'm not sure if you can read the chart, but this is a really important statistics. One out of every three black boys born today can expect to be sentenced to prison. These are a few of the systemic forces that uphold and reinforce white privilege and supremacy. Next slide, please. Now, those were the external pieces. Now we're going to look at some of the internal, the internalized, the psychological conditions that maintain a racist hierarchy. First, it's important to recognize that we've all been in, impacted by the society in which we live. So this unconscious, sometimes called implicit or unexamined racial bias is absorbed through these external conditions. Um, such as distortions and omissions in our recounting of the history of this country, or media communications and images, differential treatments and roles in society, segregate, segregated communities and social groupings. This is part of our shared social conditioning, which impacts us psychologically and physically. Um, there is a definition here of implicit bias, which I just want to um, speak about for a moment. Um, the definition reads, implicit bias, bias also referred to as unconscious bias, is the processing of associating stereotypes or attitudes toward categories of people without conscious awareness. And this lack of consciousness can result in actions and decisions that could be at odds with one's intentions or explicit values. This is similar to what um, Livingston said in the stream um, analogy. Um, another a quote about this from the um, National Equity Project is this, Part of what allows these harmful associations and assumptions about people of color to endure is the fact that we have come to accept the structural and institutional inequities we have created as normal. I'm going to repeat that. We've come to accept the structural and institutional inequities we have created as normal. So we see neighborhoods with vastly different resources, and most days we carry on with our lives, except ex, um, accepting that this is just how it is. We've come to accept the current inequitable conditions. It's the water in which we swim. So let's look at a few of the internalized or interpersonal biases that uphold racism in our society. Next slide, thanks. Okay, um, for white people, here's two examples. One is many white people, we all have really internalized a sense of racial privilege, whether it's conscious or unconscious. There is a sense of entitlement to comfort, to privilege, um, as Mickey read in the Invisible Knapsack article, just things we assume this is the way it should be. There is a possible ignorance or an attempt at ignorance that white privilege even exists and that it harms people of color. And there's a belief that some people believe actually that whiteness is superior. Um, racial privilege is an inconvenient truth that white people are conditioned not to see or if they see it to rationalize it, like blame the victim. The second um, uh, internalized um, um, condition is, um, and there are many more, but these are just two, um, that white people tend to resist surrender of their position. They don't wanna surrender their power, their benefits, um, their wealth. Um, there's a sense of entitlement and a, a, a fear, like this uh, mentality of a zero-sum gain. In other words, if you gain anything, I lose. Underlying this attitude is a sense of fear and threat. Next slide, please. 
um, for, for people of color based on this unequal, unfair treatment externally, for some people of color, there may be the internalization of a position of subordination. So to start really believing that they're, subor they're subordinate and an illusion of inferiority. For instance, questioning or doubting one's worthiness, abilities, appearance, and those that quality may lead to hopelessness and other psychological outcomes. These aspects of psychological functioning may impede people of color in their motivations and actions, thereby preventing them from achieving in ways and in areas that would challenge the current racist hierarchy. So this has been a sample of some of the many external and internal conditions that uphold and perpetuate white supremacy. In our upcoming program, we'll explore these and other factors in greater depth and how these forces manifest in our lives. So now we move on to Barbara, offering us an overview of ways in which white supremacy impacts us all. Barbara. Thank you, Judy. This is a very important section about the, um, we, we've talked about a very important section about how white supremacist culture came into existence and why, and, and how it is maintained from the beginning 16th, Bacon's Rebellion to the present day. And in most cases was maintained without people realizing that it's being maintained. And as, Judy said they had no idea that they were swimming in a, in a stream full of toxicity and racism that's propelled as something that's normal. So as we go through these um, slides, we may express um, a definition that's not exactly the same as the definition that was earlier repeated. However, it's basically, it has the same meaning and it basically um, is the same thing we're talking about. So they are consistent, but we're using different words. So pick the one that you're most, um, that says most to you. But um, in this part, we're going to be looking at racism, the facet of racism that is defined as a system of structures, policies, practices, and norms that assign value and opportunity based on the way people look or the color of their skin. And we're going to be look, looking at first, how does racism impact people of color? How does it impact the white, white people? And how does it affect society itself? Now, discovering that racism impacts, has an a, a effect on white people and on society itself may come as a surprise to many of you, but it really does. And it has a negative impact in both of these cases. We can see some of the positive impacts for white people, for instance, but there are negative impacts as well. Uh, next screen. Okay, in this discussion and the way I have um, approached the impact of white, of white supremacy, on people of color in particular, is something called race-based traumatic stress. This is a syndrome that is being currently recognized by the medical community, as well as by the psychological community. And um, as you may know, the um, medical community has um, said or cited that racism is a um, health, is a social health well, oh, what is it? A negative social health um, issue. That means it has an impact on the health of um, people of color. RBTS is the mental and emotional injury caused by encounters with racial bias and ethnic discrimination, racism, and hate crimes. This applies to all people of color because everyone may have their own, every, um, group a uh, person of color or the races may have a different experience, but they do have a negative um, experience, negative impact as a result of some of these things, which 
would be understandable. But unlike PTSD, because if you reach enough of these negative experiences, it can manifest itself as PTSD. But racial-based traumatic syndrome is not considered a mental health disorder. It is a mental injury that can occur as the result of living within a racist system or experiencing events of racism. And we all are experience these things and see what negative things that happen. Um, and it's easy for other people to say, oh, how bad that is. But it's people of color who are actually experiencing these things and having major impact um, on their lives, on their minds, on their ways of expression, as Judy um, kind of spoke up, it has a negative impact. If you can imagine all the types of things that have happened, negative, horrible, racist things that have happened to people of color over several centuries, you can imagine the impact psychologically it must have on these people who have experienced this. Race-based traumatic syndrome contains most, if not all, of the impacts related to the lived experience of being um, people, a person of color. So that is very interesting. I'd be very interested to see how this is going to be further addressed in the future. It's a recognition, at least by major um, areas of our society, that this is a health issue, mental and, so, and um, biological health issue. Um, next screen, please. Okay, as I was saying, here's a person who is being shot like arrows in, all through her, her life, his or her life. And they start to feel, you know, they risk depression, traumatic experiences. They question how can the world be so cruel? I mean, uh, and feelings of being powerless, um, decreased trust, increased survival mode. Um, to be honest with you, when we, we say um, angry black man or woman, they have every right to be angry, in my opinion, if they're going through all of these things and no one is seeming to, you know, it's like blaming the victim. Oh, well, you're an angry black woman. Well, yes, why are you angry? You know, I'm not suggesting that people should go around being angry, but if they are, we need to understand why they may be so angry. Uh, let's move on. Okay, these levels are levels of racism by which I'm seeing larger to the smaller, um, let's say, um, numbers of people involved in it. Um, these are the causes of the trauma linked to race-based traumatic syndrome. Now, I kind of believe someone else, um, I think um, Mickey showed um, a graph with racism on top and then these issues, institutional, the larger societal issues on one half and the um, personal issues on the other. I view this as a um, facet. So we can look at racism from different points of view. And I see uh, going counterclockwise, the systemic, um, which is the, the societal um, stream that we s swim in. Um, it's ongoing racial inequities uh, maintained by society. And we saw the ways in which um, society, um, white supremacy is maintained in um, Judy's presentation. And all of these things are already in existence and we are born into that system. Not only are we born into it, but the institutional the um, organizations and institutions that uh, make up our society are already um, impacted by, by the systemic system. It's impacted by, you know, it, it's in order to be consistent, it is impacted by the systemic system. So everything, it's almost like, like, the, like the stream, I suppose. Everything within institutions um, express the systemic racist issues behind it. I'm hoping I'm making myself clear. Then we move to the interpersonal. Well, because we are within the system that tells us that it, whether it's overt or covert, that black people or people of color are inferior and we see it happening, 
all around us um, with the police system, with education, with um, our jobs, all kinds of institutions, the uh, medical field and things like that, or the health field. And again, we have two systems bearing down on us saying, okay, people of color are inferior and I hate people of color or whatever the case may be. It's bigotry and biases shown between individuals and maybe groups of individuals um, through word and action. So all, you know, the, the, um, and the terrorist attacks of some kind, um, anti-Black, um, anti-Asian, um, um, and um, trying to think of the other, but at, at, at any rate, these behaviors of violence, they all come through groups of people who have bought into the system, the systemic and institutional systems, kind of brainwashed by these systems, act out to what other individuals and groups. And the more they see things changing, the more of a threat it is to them. And then we see all kinds of terrible violence going to extremes. Okay, and then we finally have what a lot of people are not really aware of until recently is the internalized. And I think Judy mentioned that it's a race-based beliefs and feelings within individuals. As I mentioned, if you have um, experienced all these things, you're going to have a pretty low sense of self-esteem unless you can somehow get out of this system and look at it clearly and be aware that it exists. If you're not aware that it exists, this is really what is going to happen. Um, let's move um, to the next screen, please. Um, a couple of other traumatic stresses, um, but, uh, vicarious stresses, witnessing traumatic events, like um, you know people getting killed by police officers, George Floyd lying in the street, unable to breathe with a um, police men's um, knee on his neck. The whole world saw this. And in a way, the whole world did wake up just a little bit as a result of it. But this has been happening forever, lynching, um, things that we're, we read about and we see it. And for some people, they can say, boy, that's a shame. We should do something about it. But for people of color, they wonder, can that happen to me? Um, transmitted stresses from generation to generation. We all know that all of this started 300, 400 years ago, went from generation to generation. What have they learned that they try to pass on to the next generation in order to keep themselves safe? Um, and a lot of these things may um, have occurred in the past and they still live on in us in the future based on what has happened to our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. It all comes down to information and knowledge that may or may not be accurate, but it has an impact. If you're told, you know, let's say back in the um, time when you have to be really careful how you move or how you act or you get lynched, you know, these are important information to know, but sometimes they might persist a little longer because it's about protection um, and protecting yourself. Next screen. Okay, health disparities. We're going to be talking um, a lot more about the health disparities that we're discovering really exist. You probably cannot see all of this, but um, it says Af African Americans are more likely to die at early ages from all causes. And this graph, graph shows like the, the purple are African Americans and the blue are white. You see a little bit difference as they age, but when you get to ages 50 to 64, the difference is a lot higher than for white people. So they're more like black, black people of color, no, African-Americans are more likely to die from stroke, although this is a low number, from diabetes, especially from the ages of 50 to 64. It's hard for me to see this as well but um, a large, larger, much larger percentage of African-Americans dying from stroke, from diabetes. And the same here with high blood pressure, though it's a lower number than I would expect. It looks like 61% versus 40 something percent. 
So health disparities is a very, very important issue. It has a lot to do with um, determinants, social determinants of health, for instance, like what kind of neighborhood you live in and what um, options you have available to you and as well as um, um, income, et cetera. So um, a very, very important issue that we will go into much more detail. Okay, next screen. Okay, the impact on white people. I, excuse me, must um, introduce Heather McGee, who wrote this book, The Summer Bus, it's on the best sellers list. The one thing I do wanna say that she will be at the Summit High School this Thursday. Um, uh, and you can register if you, I don't know if maybe we can have it magically come on the um, chat or screen, <laughs> but, um, and it's just a donation is $25, but you don't have to give that much. But she, she talks about um, belief in the zero sum game, which we heard before, you know, briefly speaking, an example of that is from slavery. If I release my slaves, then I'm going to lose, lose out, because then I have to pay somebody to do the work. So that zero sum means you win, I lose. And there's all kinds of zero sum thoughts and thinking, and it still persists even though it doesn't have to. Um, remove support once something benefits black as well as social services. Um, what that means is that sometimes through civil rights, they may say, let's integrate this pool. Well, the powers that be will close down the pool and not have a pool rather than allow Blacks to share the pool, pool with them. She is a phenomenal, I mean, there's been, if you haven't heard of her, she has been all over. Um, we've had um, programs that discuss her work and now we're lucky enough to actually have her in Summit. So if um, people want to either take a picture of this, if it, it's really going to be very, very, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, Okay, next screen. There's also economic costs to society. We're going to um, look at those things. Also some of the things that Heather McGee, he talks, McGee talks about, as well as other areas. The wealth gap between American whites and blacks is projected the cost to cost the US economy between one trillion and one point Five trillion trillion dollars we are losing the country is losing as a whole um, Citibank did a study um, and this explains the 1.5 trillion they did this study and they discovered that 16 trillion in lost gross domestic product and this included 13 trillion lost in potential business revenue because um, Heather McGee talks a lot about um, banking and how the, um, their racist attitudes and their um, very damaging um, techniques and activities um, harmed people of color. But in doing so, we lost $13 trillion in potential business revenue. Um, an estimated 6.1 million jobs not generated as a result. So if they had had these $13 trillion um, dollars in business revenue, we would have been able to have 6.1 more jobs. And lastly, 2.7 trillion in income lost because of disparities in wages. Now, what would all of this money have done to our um, economy? And we all lost out as a result of this. So we're gonna be talking about these things and how racism impacts our society impacts all of us, every single one of us. Um, okay, can we move on? Ah, so the next stage. So I, so I hope that you, uh, we, we've done um, how race came into existence, how it's maintained the impact. And this impact is, I really glossed over a lot. So, um, but there's a whole lot surprising information that hopefully could motivate at least, if you're not motivated by the injustice of racism, maybe you might be motivated by, you know, being able to pay less taxes or something if we have more of the money going into the gross domestic product. So um, 
This one is going to be um, um, run by Judith Gaston, and it's about ways to disrupt white supremacy. Judith? Hello, everyone. As Barbara mentioned, my segment of this course has to do with disrupting white supremacy. We'll begin with some documents published by the National African American Reparations Commission. They specifically outlined this plan that has about 10 points. Please go on to the next slide. Here it is. It specifically identified different areas, areas such as land ownership, funds, education, health and wellness, the criminal justice system. And as we go further into this segment, we will explore more of these ideas. Next slide, please. We'll also look at a wonderful piece of literature written by Tennessee Coates. It is entitled The Case for Reparations. It highlights um, redlining and its devastating effects. Next slide, please. We'll also look at New Jersey specifically and the statistics that the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice has published. Um, Judy mentioned it earlier, uh, but we'll go further into the details and the disparities that, has, uh, that exist, particularly for New Jersey. Next slide. We'll look at different strategies also in this segment. We'll look at perspective taking. We'll ask participants to face the realities of how race is lived by people of color in America. We'll also look at stereotypes and look, contrast that to positive images. Um, we'll look at differences that exist between stereotypes and actual facts. We'll look at the, the effects of stereotypes. And we'll also plan to equip the participants with strategies that can help them identify these stereotypes, whether they're on TV or wherever else that they may meet them. Um, we'll also look at different biases, conscious and unconscious ones. Next slide, please. As we go further into this segment, we'll look at transform act transformative activism. We'll ask participants to take the inner journey of looking at privilege and how um, um, we'll actually should say, and how, how we could work intentionally to get rid, of get rid of biases. We'll look at everyday racial profiling. We'll recognize the profiling of other races and also develop di diverse friends and honestly speak about race. That is at times a challenge for many to be comfortable enough to discuss the issue of race. We'll also take a look at the media and racism. Next slide. And at last, we will look at the interconnected foundation of oppression and the five foundations, foundational ideas um, that when taken together and addressed can make a difference as far as racism and biases. 
will look at voting rights, public education, criminal justice, economic inequalities, and healthcare disparities. Was that, I think that's our last slide. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope that all of you who participated with us tonight plan to join us as we embark on this journey of discovery. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, okay, so next year, our program schedule is going to be to start in February during Black History Month, um, the word I was looking for earlier. Um, and the um, February 12th to 20th and the 26th, there are gonna be two sessions every month. Um, and each month we'll discuss one of the four um, areas that we just shared. Um, so what is white supremacy or a white supremacist um, culture? It is a white supremacist culture that we're, we're, we're dealing with now. Um, how white supremacy is upheld will be in March. The impact of white supremacy on, on all of us will be in April and then how to disrupt. So we will have plenty of time. It will be two hours each week. We have plenty of time to investigate some of these issues um, a lot more. And I'm hoping maybe I, we can get a sense of what, some, what people are interested in and so we can focus on those things as well. And they're going to be held on Sunday afternoons, um, most likely from three to five, but maybe from two to four. Um, but um, so those are the times. Now, the reason we, we've done it this way is because we did another program last year um, called Self-Reflection with regard to race. And this, this uh, format worked very, very well. So we decided to do it again and people seem to, you know, come on a, re be able to come on a regular basis. So that's why we chose um, Sundays at afternoon. Okay, can we move to the next screen? And now it's time for Q&A. So I think we have, um, which one is it? I think we have just maybe 20 minutes, 20, 21 minutes for anybody who has questions. Um, so, Oh, um, we have a couple of uh, messages. Um, okay, so um, Marsha Bloom, uh, Bloomberg wanted to um, say that the Heather McGee, he, Heather McGee attendance doesn't require a donation. She is amazing. Okay, so who do we have next? Um, our um, techno technological wizard taking color. <laughs> Barbara, we have a raised hand in the audience. I'm going to uh, turn things over to Jerome Clark. Jerome, you can unmute yourself to ask your question. Oh, okay, um, my question is this. How do I start to discuss white supremacy with my biracial children, um, their ages uh, seven and six, and uh, the, the school we go to is only 1% black and they've already started to experience some things that they wouldn't recognize mm. as bias, um, but I can see it. So how could I even get, in, get into that? Because they're so young. I'm wondering if Mickey, uh, Mickey works in a school and is the, um, what, I, I don't remember your title, but she yes. working in that area. Hi, um, Jerome, thanks for your question. Um, you know, I believe and we believe um, at the institution where I, I work that it is important to begin talking about difference at an early age and to make sure that we um, normalize, it's not my favorite word, but that we have uh, children accustomed to um, to difference. Um, and as, you know, as possible, you know, depending upon, you know, what they're ready for, you know, it's possible to point out some of the um, inconsistencies and discrepancies and just say there was a time in our history when, um, you know, things were very different and there's still some lingering 
um, impacts from that time without making them afraid, without making them feel um, uh, self-conscious, without making them harbor any feelings of ill will towards anyone, without any guilt. Um, but it, I feel that it is important to be as truthful as we can be um, because they notice things. You know, they pick up on, on what uh, they see in their environment. So we have, uh, you know, we know that children say comments to each other based on race and other factors um, um, on a, you know, that happens on a fairly consistent basis. It's based on how they're interpreting their world. So we have to help them with that. So um, there are many uh, resources and we'd be happy to um, share some of those and we can do that as part of the course or we can do that um, in advance of that. But there are, there are many great articles um, uh, that discuss how to talk to young children about race. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to note here that Nancy Gagne has put in some, a PDF, a link to a PDF in the chat, which refers back to something that we distribute every year at the coalition's annual Talking to Children About Race event, and also some additional resources there. So there are resources for folks to take a look at there. Um, We've got a question in the Q&A, Barbara, from Janine Babakian. Will there, will there be reading assigned before each session? Um, we have planned it that way. Um, the reading will be um, significantly related to what's going to happen in the sessions, but we also would like to include, as you know, it's hard to, to, <laughs> to read all the readings. I mean, I have um, just got out of the dialogue circles on race and they gave a lot of readings with just too much reading. So we're also going to include uh, videos, um, um, other kinds of um, inf sources of information as well before the um, session and during the, the class as well. We like to, and we also will strongly encourage um, participation and discussion. Um, does that answer your question? Um, Janine won't be able to tell us because uh, of the format, but Janine, if uh, you have additional questions, please feel free. Oh, thank you. She's put it in the in the Q&A. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. And folks, if you have questions, I encourage you to either use the raise hand icon and we will unmute you just as we did with Mr. Clark, or you can type your questions into the question and A section, the question, the Q&A section. I think I see that Bonnie Rosenthal had a question. Will this be available after for viewing? I assume it means, is it being recorded, which it is. Um, and I suppose you will have access to it at, at some point. Mm -hmm. in the near future. I see Audrey nodding in affirmation. <laughs> okay. and I'm going to interpret that nod with, to say, as soon as we can get it posted on the coalition website, it will be available. And I see a thumbs up, which means that we've worked together <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I see another hand raised in our audience. Jerome? Uh, yep, Jerome again, go ahead. Please unmute yourself, I'm, Jerome. I'm sorry, I'm only raising my hand because no one else <laughs> got in. So I'm like, okay, let me get another one in. So I belong to a social justice group and um, I was wondering what tips would you give to get um, white people to speak about their feelings on white supremacy and race and not to be embarrassed um, about you know, things they know and things they don't know. And, and just to really push the imperative of how, you know, help is really needed on all fronts to help us tackle this problem. Uh, okay. Um, a lot of times, you know, even the people who are at this, at meetings like this are, we're speaking to the choir in a way, 
that people who are already open and interested in learning this, but perhaps that's a good place to start. Um, we ran a group last year um, that was the, the self-reflection group that was, um, the, the participants were all, yes, all white. And we had a, a excellent discussion and they were willing to, willing to look into themselves, willing to, they were there to learn about those things. So, and then also to, they can be very useful in addressing questions like, for instance, we had um, a group where a lot of the white um, participants were saying it's hard for them to, even in our community that's very um, diverse, it's hard for them to make friends with um, black people or people of color in the community. And that was an issue that I was shocked <laughs> actually to hear because I mean, it's, it's I mean, I would expect maybe the opposite, but um, I think it's mostly because of their own discomfort or fears. But these are new things that you can say, okay, that's interesting. And because of that, we added a, pro, um, a segment on how they can, um, or ways to go about uh, meeting people of color. But, and you can address the same things. And then maybe, you know, you learn a lot that you didn't really know about what their own um, fears and concerns as well. But I would start, you know, with, I don't know, are you from Maplewood or, or South Orange? I'm from uh, Denville, which is Morris County. Ah, are you part of the? Um, someone asked me from the of the Denville Voices. For, oh, yeah, I'm I'm the vice president. Yeah. Oh, you're the vice president. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was going to reach out to you guys to see if we can work jointly anyway, but um, is your community diverse? No, it's not. It's not really diverse. Our community. No, it's uh, like I said, the, the school my kids go to, uh, Riverview Elementary, is only. Ah that black and uh and just just the town in general um it really isn't that diverse and we've had issues within the town of people writing the n-word on side of sides of buildings oh, really um, yeah and swastika signs down in the park and hmm. things well, like you know? that. and it's something that i i really want to tackle head on but i don't feel sure. like we're enough um in a community and 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 i i, I to me it's a matter of life and death because it is because yeah. I'm a black man and I have black children and I don't, right. I don't have the luxury to take my time in this. I'm 46 mm. years old and I'm, I'm really trying to get everyone. We are in a state of emergency and I, I just, mm. people really have to see that with everything that's going on. Um, you know, so it's hard when I don't receive the same level of passion and, 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 and kind of the, just moseying on through it, but um, I try to give out literature. I try to recommend books. I try to recommend movies and things like that. And, you know, to friends and family members, um, you know, cause like I said, my kids are biracial and it, it just doesn't seem to be setting in. And I don't know if, if there's something I should be doing different. Well, I'm sorry to hear that um, Denver is going through that. What I might suggest is to take this offline and perhaps we can get together the uh, coalition representatives and your organization. We can get together and maybe talk about it in more detail. Because I did plan to reach out to you, but I didn't know who to re reach out to. <laughs> but now I have your name and yeah. um, I will find it. Can you put in the chat some information like where I can... Sure, I'll send you my phone number and my email in a chat. Yes, okay, please do that. All right. Anybody else? Barbara, if I could just add to what you've already shared, I, I Jerome, would just recommend that you, if possible, and hopefully it is possible that you identify um, some allies, even if it's just a couple of people um, who can work with you, um, who can, you know, become more educated about this and then help you in terms of um, creating a broader coalition of people. But I do think, um, you know, it's going to be. I, I hear you that it is challenging, but I think if you can identify some white allies, and in my mind, allyship means action, not just, you know, being someone who, you know, you know, reads and stays home, but someone who 
um, really, um, you know, is active in that in that support. Um, I I feel like that would be helpful, and then you you would have another spokesperson who might be able to help bring some people on board. I know that very often these conversations are hard because people are afraid to be judged or um, you know, there's a feeling of guilt. Um, so it could even be possible that, you know, a, a white affinity space, meaning a space where, you know, white people can gather with someone knowledgeable um, to talk about this could be helpful as well. So there are many ideas and I, I look forward to, um, you know, um, having more of a dialogue with you as, um, you know, we, we bring the two groups together. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm having a problem with the chat sending my information. Uh, it's not letting me do it through the chat. Oh, that's right. That's, um, okay, is is well, there an email I can email you directly? Yeah, I can give it to you. Um, okay. unless, um, unless Audrey or Nancy want it. Okay, I'll put my email. We probably have the email through the registration, and we can reach oh. out to you, Jerome. Okay. 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 I'll look through there. Great. Oh, any other questions? Oh, looks like seven, eight. Andrew Weinberger. I think if they are good friends, you might, I think maybe this is a response to Jerome. I think if they are good friends, you might tell them it would help you for them to discuss their feelings about this. Others might disagree. Um, so that, that's a suggestion if you have good friends that would be able to help you. So thank you very much, Jerome, for uh, raising that issue and opening up a potential, you know, to work together. And let me just say to you that um, you said swell stickers and um, uh, N word on the walls, although I don't think it was a life or death situation, but that was the reason why our Community Coalition on Race got founded because of those things were happening in our community as well, back in the 90s. I want to acknowledge we've got another raised hand. Uh, Reverend Dr. Pritchett, I'm going to allow uh, you to talk. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Pritchett. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Thank you. Just uh, well, I'll I'll go to uh, Jerome. Are you listening now? I'm there. I'm listening. Got you. I was just curious. In Denville, are your activities of Denville Voices is it sanctioned or coordinated? Is it uplifted by the Denville City Council? No, it is not. All right, because my one that, suggestion every, I would everything make we is do, that, everything we do is is within our each other, you know, within our own groups, and we we at one time partnership with the library yes, um, for a critical race theory uh, seminar, but at the yes. last minute, the library, you know, kind of pulled the plug, so to speak. Oh. So ever okay. since then, we've indeed, been on indeed. our own. I, I suspected um, part of my um, motivation here is to say that I can recall. Uh, well, this is going to be a long time ago, but in Denville, 30 to 40 years ago, uh, there was a deacon in one of the local churches, I was very familiar, who actually had a cross burned on his lawn. He lived in Denville. And uh, oh, so I'm, using, I'm saying my context is not as an outsider, but someone who's intimately familiar with. But what I was going to suggest is that your group um, should approach the city, uh, whatever it's called, the city council, and ask okay. them to endorse your efforts. Uh, that's really going to put the spotlight in a very public uh, way on them, puts a little bit of pressure on them. But uh, I, I cannot see why they wouldn't. I think through the public pressure, they should say and do something that uplifts, whether they, however that is done. Be, that's a similar model to what I've seen in West Orange, where they have a human relations uh, commission or human relations um, council which is tied right into their um, city council structure. So that, okay. in essence, you're putting the responsibility. Right now, all the responsibility is on you all. You're like what Dr. King would call the beloved community. Uh, you're doing the best you can do out of your own personal uh, motivations. But you actually ought to put um, the spotlight on the city, uh, the perks, you know, who run the city. 
and because this the time is right, and this would expose them to the public. I say in the context of you should make them make a decision. And the fact that they were to make a negative decision, then you all ought to call in uh, the local newspapers in the area and actually have someone, a good journalist, do a story on that. Because the more, you, you guys have power, you have pressure. Uh, you've got to probably shift a little bit into an, you, what you're doing now is fine, but adding a little bit of an activist role in the public sector is what I would suggest next. So I, I hope you, um, uh, I'm at Seton Hall University. Uh, I could put my name and email in the chat also. If I could be of a resource to you, I'd be more than happy. That would that would be great. Every you know, I I totally agree on everything you just said, and that's what I'm trying to get uh, the group to to you know get to that point also that it's no, you know sorry. great we're doing these things, but it's time more action needs to be taken. Um, indeed, indeed. I, I have a feeling I uh, I may forget the I thought. This past June, I thought I may have uh, spoken at the Juneteenth ceremony. I thought it was in Denville. It was either Denville uh, or the Dover area, but I know it was at near the high school. But I, I'm just sharing that I could sense a lot of good vibrations in the air and a lot of good intentions. And I'm just trying to encourage you to take it to the next level. You're not in this struggle alone. And indeed, I think uh, those who are administer these cities, and who have been voted, we should put some of the responsibility right in their laps to do um, something publicly. And obviously, if they don't do the right thing, that's an opportunity uh, that can lend itself, uh, unfortunately, to embarrass them publicly. Um, that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say, actually, was to this committee. I wanted to comp compliment you all. And if I were giving a report card out today, I, I, I don't see how I could not give you an A. Because you guys were extremely comprehensive, right on target, and I would look forward, God willing, to uh, supporting as much of the programming as possible. But oh, you did an exceptional job. I don't know if you've done this before. Maybe I should have asked that question. <laughs> because no, well, said, we uh, did it for the trustees of the co of the coalition. Got you. But no, we you, got the um, same grade, I guess. And believe me, I'm I'm kind of hard when it comes to. <laughs> Folks putting on seminar. I just said it in terms of grading, but no, I just wanted to make sure I did give you a compliment before the evening was over. And I, I thank you so much. That all of your efforts will be very fruitful. I'm looking forward to it myself. Great. Thank you so much for both your um, suggestions and for your um, assessment. I think we have another. We do. One last logistical question that is uh, here in the Q&A section, Barbara, is from Valerie Laidling. And uh, I apologize, Valerie, if I have butchered your name. Um, my apologies. But Valerie asks, within any given session, roughly how much time will be presentation versus discussion among participants regarding strategies, forging such allies, et cetera? Well, it's really hard to say. We have the general outline of our discussions, I mean, of our curriculum for each week, but we're not completely finished with that. So it will probably shift depending on what topic we're talking about, but we definitely feel that interaction and discussion is, is critical. So there'll be plenty of room for that. Um, um, the first three are more educative, educative in nature. So that, you know, the discussions would be about that. As far as what you said, strategies, most of those will probably come from the last um, part, which is, you know, how to disrupt. Um, uh, is that what you meant? Well, I can't ask a question. I forgot. But I'm, I'm hoping that's what you meant by strategies. I'm not sure. Um, oh. And I think... From what I'm seeing in the chat now, Valerie says thanks. So I think that okay. must have covered it. And I think now we're ready to turn things over to Nancy, who can talk about how people can register for this series of events. Nancy? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think uh, Reverend Fars Pritchett, you didn't steal my thunder, but you just, you went ahead and said exactly what uh, I would say. This was 
an, uh, an amazing presentation full of so much great information. And for those of you who are uh, still with us, spread the word. We will post this. Uh, you can share it with people. We really want these um, workshops uh, that will happen in um, 2023 to be uh, well-filled and robust and lots and lots of learning and exchange between lots of lots of different people. Um, you can see from all of the information presented tonight, there is just so much to delve into. And uh, we're a little, I, if you're like me, feeling a little overwhelmed, and this is not my first time through this. Um, so I am certainly looking forward to the depth and breadth that I know our presenters are going to provide us with. And you see that QR code on the screen. You can register there. And after tonight, you'll be able to uh, do that on our website as well, um, probably in the next day or so. So if you don't catch the QR code, absolutely uh, visit our website. You'll see it uh, in our e-newsletter coming out at the end of the week as well. Um, and I do want to go back and uh, once again thank our presenters, uh, the entire anti-racism uh, committee for this informative introduction. Um, and like I said, we encourage you to spread the word. Thanks to uh, Audrey Rowe, program director, who supports all the work of all of these committees, and to Tegan Culler, who it does uh, the amazing job for so many of our uh, uh, Zoom meetings and, and webinars. I want to uh, remind us, you can see Tegan and me and a few others uh, next week, um, December 7th. Uh, at 7.30 is the presentation of our updated demographics report 